the Johns Hopkins Science Review, presented by the Johns Hopkins University and WAAM in Baltimore. This is the Johns Hopkins University, famed for 75 years for its contributions to science and the humanities. Here in its many laboratories, Hopkins scientists are constantly probing into the basic, still unknown facts of science, which, when discovered, are translated into benefits to be enjoyed by you, the people of America. Tonight we present a special program, one in which science plays an important part, one in which you play an important part. For tonight, we go back into American history for the story of a parchment. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another Johns Hopkins Science Review. You have just listened to a few words, a few words that were once written on a piece of parchment. A parchment very much like the one I hold here in my hand. Now this parchment measures 24 by 29 inches, and you could buy it today for about $2.68. But you cannot judge a parchment by the paper on which it is written. You must know what words are on that paper and what those words signify. Let me show you this, for example. I have a, a facsimile here, a facsimile of a famous piece of parchment. This parchment also measures about 24 by 29 inches, but it's 175 years old. Nevertheless, the original of this parchment has no monetary value, cannot be purchased. It is truly priceless. Priceless because the words written on it and the historic significance of these words. This parchment is part of our democratic heritage, the document which gave birth to the United States of America. This is a facsimile of our Declaration of Independence, the first of several documents which establish the rights of free people to live their lives as they choose. The story of this parchment began on June 7, 1776, at the meeting of the Continental Congress, when Richard Henry Lee of Virginia rose to his feet and introduced a resolution. Gentlemen, as the representative from Virginia, it is an honor for me to present you with a resolution from the people of my state. We of Virginia trust that this resolution will be adopted by this august body with spirit and unanimity. Resolved that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. That they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. That it is expedient forthwith to take the most effectual measures for forming foreign alliances. That a plan of confederation be prepared and transmitted to the respective colonies for their consideration and approbation. Four days later, on June 11th, the Continental Congress appointed Philip Livingston of New York John Adams of Massachusetts, Robert Sherman of Connecticut, Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania, and Thomas Jefferson of Virginia as a committee to draft a declaration. Jefferson performed his historic part at the urging of John Adams, who insisted that the author should be a Virginian with a happy talent of composition. In the Philadelphia home of a young German bricklayer named Graf, Jefferson wrote the original draft. With a few changes made by Adams and Franklin, the Declaration was reported to the Continental Congress on June 28, 1776. The Declaration was approved on July 2nd and was adopted by Congress on July 4th. The document was printed by John Dunlop 
a Philadelphia printer on July 5th. Congress ordered the declaration to be engrossed on parchment, and the copy was made on one sheet by the skilled hands of Timothy Matlack, master penman. The original and only copy of the Declaration of Independence was signed by the members of the Continental Congress present on August 2nd, 1776. The document was handed to Charles Thompson, Secretary of the Continental Congress, for safekeeping in his office, where it remained until December 12th. On December 12th, Congress was forced to leave Philadelphia because of advancing British regiments and hold its session in Baltimore. The declaration traveled to Baltimore. Later, it was taken to York, Pennsylvania for temporary lodging in the courthouse. And a year later, it was transported to Princeton, New Jersey, and then to Annapolis, Maryland. And the following year, 1784, it reposed in Trenton, New Jersey. In 1785, it was taken to New York City, where it was kept in the second story of the city hall. When the government moved to Philadelphia in 1790, the Declaration of Independence went along and remained in Philadelphia until President John Adams moved the capital to Washington, D.C. Traveling through storms, freezing cold, and intense heat in saddlebags and crude wagons, subjected to bright light, atmospheric changes, rolled and unrolled hundreds of times, the Declaration of Independence faded, cracked, and the signatures became dim. In order to preserve the message and signatures, this facsimile was made in 1823 by William J. Stone. The original manuscript was handed about from place to place, exhibited in Washington, D.C. in one building after another, until September 29, 1921, when President Warren G. Harding signed an official order turning the declaration over to the Library of Congress. When this precious document entered the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., a new chapter in its history began. And tonight, it is an honor to have with us Dr. Luther H. Evans, Librarian of Congress, who will continue another part of the story of this parchment. The day after President Harding signed the order to transfer to the library the Declaration of Independence and also the Constitution, Dr. Herbert Putnam, the librarian, called at the office of the Honorable Charles Evans Hughes, Secretary of State, and received the documents from Mr. Hughes. The framed declaration was placed in the library's mail truck on a pile of leather mail bags, and thus the precious parchment was transported to the library building where Dr. Putnam placed it in his safe, in his office. Four days later, Dr. Putnam defined for the architects the requirements of the permanent and safe display of the Declaration and the Constitution. At the earliest opportunity, on January 16, 1922, he asked the House Appropriations Committee for $12,000 to construct such a display area. His request was quickly granted, and this design was prepared by Francis H. Bacon. Construction was begun within a few months, and after the marble, bronze, and glass shrine was completed, on February 24, the 28th, 1924, it was dedicated in the presence of President and Mrs. Calvin Coolidge, Secretary Hughes, and a representative group from the Congress. Dr. Putnam fitted the Declaration into its case, then arranged the leaves of the Constitution, closed the lid, and turned the keys in the locks of the two cases. Not a word was spoken, yet the ceremony was as moving as it was outwardly austere. Dr. Putnam records that the impression upon the audience proved the emotional potency of documents animate with tradition. Since then, these priceless documents have been on display at the library for all to see. Many millions of citizens have paused to look and to think about the heritage each possesses, the power of freedom embodied in these documents. But the travels of the documents were not over. On December 23, 1941, following the attack on Pearl Harbor, 
Mr. Archibald MacLeish, the Librarian of Congress, and his associates carefully took the documents from the shrine and packed them for safekeeping. At five o'clock on the afternoon of December 26th, Mr. Werner W. Clapp, then Director of Administration and now Chief Assistant Librarian, supervised the loading of the box into an armored truck and drove to the Union Station where the box was placed in the Pullman compartment of the National Limited of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Accompanied by Secret Service agents, Mr. Clapp took his valuable cargo to Louisville, Kentucky, where he was met by a troop of soldiers who accompanied him to the Bullion Depository at Fort Knox. During its wartime deposit at Fort Knox, the declaration was examined at intervals by Mr. Clapp and parchment specialists to make sure that no further harm had come to it. Early in the fall of 1944, military authorities sent word that all danger from enemy attack had passed. And on Sunday, October 1st, the doors of the library were opened at half past 11. The declaration had come home. An episode in its life history was over. As you have seen tonight, the writing on the parchment has faded so that the names of the signers can barely be seen. There is reason to believe that the disintegration has been arrested, but we must constantly keep ourselves informed of the scientific advances which may be used to preserve the document indefinitely. During the past 10 years, we have been working with the National Bureau of Standards, and particularly of late with my old friend, Dr. Edward U. Condon, its director, on a new method of preservation. Recently, we have also had the cooperation of the Libby Orange Ford Glass Company. To tell about this scientific episode, we have with us Dr. Condon, director of the National Bureau of Standards. Thank you, Dr. Evans. The problem of preserving such an important document as the Declaration of Independence was complicated by the fact that this document must be prepared to be exhibited where it can at all times be seen by all the citizens of the United States, each of whom is a part owner of this document. A second problem was that the necessary scientific experiments could not, of course, be performed on the document itself. Therefore, parchment facsimiles of the original were obtained by the National Bureau of Standards to be used in this research. From past experience, our scientists knew that there are three major causes for the deterioration of a parchment. First, the ordinary air which we breathe contains elements which cause destruction. Oxygen is particularly destructive, as are also small amounts of sulfur dioxide. Secondly, too much or too little moisture contributes to the deterioration of parchment. High humidity is bad, and a very dry atmosphere causes it to become brittle and crack. Third, in addition to the harm caused by air and water vapor, light radiation causes damage by inducing chemical reactions within the parchment and the ink. After several years of research, it was decided to seal the manuscript in an atmosphere of helium, which was obtained from the Bureau of Mines. This helium is 99.99% pure and is quite free of oxygen. Research indicated that the relative humidity of the helium used should be between 25 and 35% at room temperature. And tests proved a specially developed laminated yellow glass filter would protect the declaration from harmful light rays. The yellow color also serves to improve the legibility of the faded writing. Working together, the scientists have devised a new method of preserving such precious documents. If you will watch, we will reconstruct the highlights of the action which took place last week in the final preservation of the Declaration of Independence. Thermopane glass made by the Libby Owens Ford Company forms the airtight envelope in which the manuscript is to be sealed. The pane of glass is thoroughly cleaned. Then compressed air is blown over it to blow away any particles remaining and to dry the glass. Around the edge of each pane is a strip of lead, three-eighths of an inch thick. These strips make the seal for the envelope. 
The original document, in this case the Declaration of Independence, was carefully placed on the glass. Then to absorb even the slightest bit of moisture caused by changes in humidity, and to cushion the document, a special piece of cellulose paper made from cotton rags was placed on the back of the document. Carefully adjusted so they fit to a fraction of an inch, the document and cellulose paper are fitted in the envelope. With the document in place, a cover glass was slowly placed over the Declaration of Independence to keep it from wrinkling, to hold it securely in the glass envelope where it is to remain for centuries. Because the glass must remain airtight and retain proper humidity, this leak detector was inserted so that technicians can determine whether or not a leak has developed, which will allow oxygen to seep between the panes and damage the manuscript. Two of these leak detectors are sealed in slots cut in the bronze bracket. The detectors operate because each gas has a unique quality in its ability to transfer heat. Any change in the composition of the gas inside the glass envelope can be observed by measuring the change in its thermal conductivity. When the leak detectors are securely sealed in place, a bronze bracket is fitted around the edge of the glass covers. This bracket joins the backing glass, the cellulose paper, the manuscript, and the cover glass into a unit measured to a split inch the enclosure is now one tight little envelope. A top glass panel is fitted over the bronze bracket. Then the entire unit is ready to be soldered. Soldering the lead strips to the glass plate is one of the most critical steps in the entire process of preserving the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. The thermopane glass you see here will withstand the heat without damage to the manuscript inside. Tubes are sealed into holes which have been drilled through the lead strips in the upper right and lower left hand corners of the unit. These holes are drilled through the lead seal. The tubes are then soldered into the holes. As stated before, it was decided that helium should replace the air inside the glass envelope. In its pure state, helium cannot possibly contribute to the deterioration of parchment. Copper pipes are attached to the outlet tube at the bottom and to the inlet tube at the top. The inlet tube carries the helium into the envelope at the top, and it is carried out at the bottom. Pure helium contained in the cylinder under a very high pressure is passed through a tube into a pressure reduction valve and into this humidifying unit. Here the helium is humidified by passing it through distilled water, maintained at a temperature of 4 to 6 degrees centigrade. In this manner, sufficient water vapor is added to the pure helium to produce a relative humidity of 25 to 35 percent at room temperature. As Dr. G. M. Klein shows, the helium entering here spreads out across the entire portion of the glass envelope, pushing the air in front of it. As it spreads, the helium forces the air out of the envelope, and the air escapes through the bottom tube, which is connected by copper tubing to a bubble counter and gas seal. This gas seal prevents the air from backing up through the tube. This flushing process, the helium forced into the envelope and over the face of the document, continues for two weeks. Finally, Scientific apparatus indicates that all the air within the glass enclosure has been flushed out. The tubes are then removed and sealed, and the Declaration of Independence has been scientifically preserved, has been protected against further damage. In brief, this is the story of the method developed by the National Bureau of Standards for the preservation of the Declaration of Independence. The research leading to this method was to begun 10 years ago, interrupted by the war, and continued to a successful conclusion this week. The scientific research and the practical applications of that research have been done in order that this great document, yours and mine, may be seen by generations to come as a reminder of their democratic freedom.
And for us, this is an example of another realm in which science serves each one of us, the part that science has played in the story of this parchment. But on Constitution Day, September 17th, 1951, we were privileged to watch another chapter, another episode in the story of the parchment. As we stood in the main hall in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we saw a procession approaching. This procession was led by the President of the United States. Following him was Dr. Luther Evans. And then came Fred M. Vinson, Chief Justice of the United States. And then Theodore F. Green, Senator from Rhode Island. And then Dr. Edward U. Condon and other dignitaries of the government. The Reverend Frederick Brown Harris, Chaplain of the United States Senate, offered the invocation. Senator Theodore Green spoke to those present, outlining the purpose of the occasion. He then introduced the Honorable Fred M. Vinson, Chief Justice of the United States, who said, Today, we seal for all time in envelopes of glass the original and grossed copies of the two documents closest to the hearts of all Americans, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. At the framing of the Constitution, as during other crises in our history, it is in our nation's best tradition to subordinate partisan and sectional interests to the common good. As we face the crises of today, the American people stand together under the Constitution. At the close of his address, Justice Vinson unveiled the newly preserved parchment, the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence in a carefully designed frame having great strength, but real simplicity befitting the simple wording and great power of the document it encloses. Then the President of the United States reminded his audience that we have met here this morning to put some pieces of parchment in specially sealed cases in order to preserve them from physical and chemical change. These are already old documents, written in a style and a hand no longer familiar to us. If they were only historical relics, it might seem strange that we should make a ceremony out of this occasion of sealing them up. But the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, said the President, are more than historical relics. They are a living force in our life today. On this occasion, we ought to pray to Almighty God that the American people will remain faithful to the spirit of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. We should ask that they be ever mindful of the great wisdom and truth that are embodied in these two documents and through them in our form of government. If the American people remember these things and understand them well, continued the chief executive, this nation will move forward in the future as it has in the past. And these documents which we are today sealing against physical decay will always be remembered and cherished, finding new life in each new generation of Americans. Senator Green then invited the President, the Chief Justice, and Dr. Herbert Putnam to place the first page of the Constitution of the United States in its glass container. This is the final page, the final manuscript to be sealed. All others are now in place for all time. Sealed against the ravages of time and placed where all Americans may see them. Senator Green then entrusted this last document to Dr. Edward U. Condon, as he said, in full knowledge of the competence you and your staff have displayed in the work already done. Then, Dr. Condon accepted the trust, stating, we accept the trust you have placed in us as guardians of these documents for the American people. documents in place, Senator Green invited the president to lock the lid of the shrine. 
perform the final act of placing on exhibition these famous documents. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Gentlemen, today we have signed this Constitution for our new country. As each of us signs, let us vow never to forget the final words of our Declaration of Independence. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. With these words, we close tonight's story of a parchment. But it's an unfinished story. Many chapters are yet to be written, and we have a firm conviction that glorious chapters will still be written founded on the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States, written for free people. This story will go on through the ages to come, through the centuries to come, as we keep trust with our own people and with those people around the world who place confidence, much confidence, in all of us. The trust that is placed in us is a trust that must be kept by you and by me. It is within our power to preserve this Constitution. They are preserving it all around the world as our men are guarding these rights. The men that are fighting in Korea today are preserving it, and they need your help. The Red Cross needs your help. Their blood bank is very low. And may we ask that you help preserve this freedom by offering your blood to your blood bank in your city. We are honored that the Johns Hopkins Science Review was chosen to bring you this story of a parchment. We thank the directors of the Library of Congress and the National Bureau of Standards for their courtesy. And we hope you will be with us next week when we present What is New in X-Ray. <laughs>